I came today with one goal in mind. I'm, I'm going to take the level of the presentation so far and go down a level in the technology a bit. And I don't want to get too complicated, but uh, I would like to create a concept that is very concrete and to help you understand where AI is going to help the entire content industry go. You'll see that in some of the pictures I, I show, it's similar to what you've seen before about technology, but this time I'm going to take about, talk about content. And m more exactly, I'm going to talk about knowledge, because we see everything as knowledge. It doesn't matter where it came from or what the format was. <laughs> um, this is where it all started. Somebody says, this is the property of this thing, or this is how big the fish was that I caught, or this is how I pulled the fish in out of the ocean, or this is how I started this fire. But there's a story. Everybody's a storyteller. They start with A and they end at Z. This could result in a topic, a very small wiki topic, this could result in a very long document. Um, I've seen some customers with documents that are 1,100 pages long, which is quite a lot in one document. The problem is, is that as we evolved, the numbers of stories started to grow, and we had more and more and more and more of them. So we had to find a way to write them down because there was no way to preserve it from one generation to the next. What was this information? What was this story? What was the knowledge? How did the fish get caught? What's the best way to catch the fish? How do I do international financial reporting guidelines properly for the EU and then there's stuff in the US? How do I put all of this stuff together? It can get quite complicated and that's exactly what happened back then is it started to get very complicated. So you can see they spent quite a lot of time recording their processes or their stories in stone. Obviously this got out of hand so they had to find a formalized way of handling it. And so we developed a formalized system of writing. And that was all well and good for quite some time, and it helped the Egyptians form a great empire. But that too got out of hand, because the depth of the knowledge that we were working with became deeper and deeper and more detailed. What should I do? How do I catch the fish? What are the properties of this fish? It, it just, it's mind-blowing. So of course, we had to invent printed books. This gave us the um, ability to take a significant amount of information and record it from A to Z. In this case, this is a very old German book about cooking fish. In, well, in this part right here, it's about lemon sauce. Of course, that got out of hand as well. And so we ended up with libraries like this. And who knows what's on these shelves after a while. And the problem with these libraries is they're all over the world, in every city, in every town. In every business, you have libraries. These days, they're kind of online. But you have libraries in, in multiple countries, and they contain all of the knowledge about what that business knows how to do. It's essentially the core information of the business. It is the business. Without that knowledge, the business would be gone. But accessing that knowledge is very difficult. Because when I know I want something about cooking fish in lemon sauce, I know that these are the books where that knowledge exists. But I still hope to open every single book and look through it and read through it to make sure that I have found every relevant section that is important to my need. This can be a big problem when it comes to compliance. Because with the companies, going through information in this type of process, there's no guarantee that every worker has seen every relevant passage they need to see in order to ensure compliance and reduce corporate risk. But we have been saved. And in the last uh, 10 years, there was a lot of trumpeting about how we have been saved. And the savior was digital assets and digital asset management, digitalization, so now we have all of that paper gone. Well, that, that does help a lot. It reduced costs, but has it really changed anything? Let's look at what most companies have today. This is a picture of SharePoint, and it has a contracts handbook in it from one company that I know. And this contracts handbook 
has, so oh, I think it's 130 documents and about 80 folders. It's about 1,000 pages of material. When I do a search, you can see this a little bit up here. Um, I can't even read it. <laughs> it's too small. Uh, it's about performance guarantees. So the contracts handbook is telling, it's, it's, the, it's the procedures in the company for the lawyers who are responsible for setting up contracts for vendors and partners. And the goal of this 1,100 page set of documents together is to show them what they need to include and what they need to exclude in order to reduce corporate risk, financial risk, in case something goes wrong with one of those deals. So when all of this is in SharePoint, using a standard enterprise search, somebody does a search for performance guarantees and reliability obligations, and they get a hit list. And the hit list is often with some little hint text. So now I know within this entire group of things, I have six documents, and these are equivalent to those six big fat books that you've seen previously. And from each one of those books, I pulled one extract. Now, that might be a good clue of where to start, but if I want to be compliant, or if I really want to know what's going on, theoretically, I have to click on every single one of these documents, then it has to download into my browser, and then I have to start scrolling through it. This is no different than this. It's just digital, so it hasn't really saved us much except the cost of printing. Oh, so here are the actual things. It's 1,600 pages. So here we are again with the same example, and we search specifically for performance guarantees for the plant system. So a very specific long tail search, thinking I'll get one document, and I'll have exactly the information that I need. The problem is that you won't. In this very real example, you get three pages of this out of the enterprise search. You get the title of the document, and you get a hint text out of each document. Some of these things seem a bit harmless. Six pages, three pages, four pages. Yeah, well, the first three hits aren't the ones that I was looking for, but I don't know that until after I've clicked all three of them open, and I found out, oh, that's not what I'm working for, looking for. So then I come down here, and I find this one was 19 pages long, but the title is misleading and the hint text is also has nothing to do with what I wanted. But the search text was somehow in here and so the enterprise search engine says this might be the thing you're looking for. But maybe I look at it and I say, well, that's not what I want. So I don't click. And then I can continue down the list. Another eight pages, another 13 pages. Am I going to be compliant? Am I going to read through every document on every page and I have three pages of this? What's the answer? Do you do this? No. You look at the first three, and if the answer's not there, then you do another search, or you look someplace else, or better yet, you ask the other person in your office, because that's the person who's maybe 58 years old and has been with the company for a long time and knows exactly how things get done without having to do this. The result is this. This is what everybody is dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis in business. One little search results in an overload of documents or an overload of books. These could be web pages. It doesn't really matter how long or how short this thing is. This goes a little bit further. To help understand how the process is developing or what's broken, you can take a look at database-oriented knowledge and the way this works on the web. You ask Siri or Alexa, how old is Angelina Jolie? And you get a very quick answer. Where does this come from? It comes out of a database. Or it's been extracted out of a very short wiki topic. This is an easy exercise. People have been doing this for 20 years. It's just now on a, on a uh, mobile phone. Database-oriented knowledge works very well. What is the capital of New York? Albany, again, pulled out of a wiki page. And then, using knowledge graph technology, we, know, we have associated maps and we have some other associated information about Albany and it's all picked to get, put, pulled together and associated nicely for the end user so that they can learn about the capital of New York. Unstructured document-oriented knowledge is a different problem and it's still a problem today. So, Alexa, tell me about EU trust and social networks. What do you get on your mobile phone when you ask it a question like this? You get that. 
And that is no different than the three pages of stuff out of SharePoint on the legal contract, and it's that. Now, one of my favorite uh, um, Americans to quote is Yogi Berra. He was an American baseball player in the 1950s, and he had some really nice quotes, a nice way of saying things that were a bit zen, and he said, if you ask me anything I don't know, I'm not going to answer. And that's essentially what's happening here. This can't answer because it doesn't know anything. The knowledge isn't available in any kind of format. It's just lumps and lumps of documents. And that's the result. This is also the driver of change in businesses today. How do you get beyond this? It's not only a compliance problem, but it's a productivity problem, a business agility problem. Reaction times are down. Customer service is mediocre. They ask you the same questions over and over and over again, like you're an idiot. And, and in the end, it's because the people who are on the line trying to help you solve your problem, they don't know anything because you're asking them something they don't know and they can't answer. <clears throat> there are some irrefutable facts that come out of this line of reasoning and it just takes a moment to forget about the past and think about them. One of them is we are storytellers, so we record our knowledge from A to Z. Documents are ideal for this. People can structure their knowledge, they can organize their knowledge, and they can tell the story. But as we have seen, documents are the absolute worst way to access knowledge. Because this is not what people want. People want an answer. What is all the relevant information that I need for my task? That might come from many places. It usually does come from many places. For example, if I'm working on an assembly line or I'm a designer in an automotive company and I need to design a car seat, I have to take into account my internal manufacturing procedures, safety information about car seats that are coming out of Germany, safety procedures and manufacturing norms coming out of the EU, ISO procedures and who knows whatever else, stuff that's coming, for customer specifications also, because I'm manufacturing car seats that go into an Audi, so Audi tells me what I have to do to their car seats to make them fit. All of these things are coming from different locations. And very important, which is coming to one of something that you brought up about the metadata, all of this external stuff is coming via PDF. And it doesn't have any metadata. And there's so much of it that there's nobody in the company who can add any of it. And they can't add taxonomy either. You get this collection of thousands and thousands of documents, and there's no way to make heads or tails of it. And you wouldn't want to anyway, because in six months you get a new batch that replaces the old batch, and the problem is completely different. So the best way to solve that problem is to not solve it. The other irref irrefutable fact is the answers we need today are no longer found in one place and in one document. So when I do a search, like at Google, and Google floats up Albany to the top, well, that's great, it came out of a database. But if I am in a company and I need an answer about how do I manufacture this car seat, the information is instantly coming out of multiple places. Finding one document in a search engine is not going to help me. It's not going to solve the problem. So we need a totally new knowledge paradigm in order to get to the information that we need so that we can work. Let's take a look at where companies are storing their information. They have it in websites. They have it in documents in SharePoint. They have it in Office 365 online, SharePoint online. They have it in Dropbox or in Box, which was mentioned earlier today. Everything should be in Box. That doesn't solve the problem. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> File servers, wikis, content services, and a lot of different documents in a lot of different formats. What's good about this, this was also mentioned in an earlier presentation, and it's absolutely correct. Every person in every company, in different locations, in different job processes, they do things differently. They tell their story from A to Z using different tools. They use what they know how to use. Somebody who might be in charge of creating the, the menu for the cafeteria network in the company might be used to using a notepad for this or some other tool that's very, very simple and then saving it on a file system. Whereas somebody who's manufacturing, sorry, not manufacturing, somebody who is um, maintaining financial reporting guidelines might be working in an authoring team with Microsoft Word doing some highly structured work and saving all of this stuff in SharePoint someplace. And everybody should use what they know. 
one size fits all doesn't work. But how do you make this knowledge accessible coming from all of these places, all of these sources, and all across the planet for a company? We apply some AI and some machine learning. But the problem is, how do you read documents? How do you read this stuff, this unstructured stuff? It's so easy with databases. And of course, that's the answer right there. We make it databaseable, which means first we have to take these documents and we have to atomize them into paragraphs, lists, tables, and images. Little tiny components of knowledge where each component has a fact, a process. We atomize them. And then the trick that's just like database and just like Albany, we normalize them. So we make them all the same format. If they're all the same format, and every single one of them has one thought, then we can process them. So if I take all of these documents and I atomize all of them, I can end up with something like this, where every single one of these is a paragraph, or a table, or an image, or a list. Then what I can do using some AI and machine learning is I can start identifying relationships between these atoms. I call them knowledge atoms. So, these atoms were in this topic. This topic was in this subtopic, or this parent topic, and this parent topic, and this, were, this was in this document, and this document is part of this document collection. And then I can see between all of these knowledge atoms what seems to be the same. Are they referring to each other? Are they talking about the same thing? I can create relationships. So now when a user wants to know how do I bake fish with lemon sauce, instead of looking through all of the documents to get the answer to this and ending up with a stack of documents that they have to open up and read, a specialized type of query goes into the atoms, finds all of the atoms that are responding to their need, dynamically assembles them into an answer. And the result is a little bit more livable. All of the documents that are available, but only the specific sections that I need, and then arranged on the page. So how do I do this? Instant answer, get to work. And I know the answer is correct because it came from the information. How this would look in real life? Performance guarantees plant system obliga customer obligations. So instead of that SharePoint list of document hits that you saw before, the user gets all of the paragraphs, lists, list items, and things from different sections. So where today we ask um, Google or something else about EU trust and social networks, and we get this list. And if this list is a whole bunch of PDFs, which also happens within companies, and the users sit there clicking and clicking on their PDFs, waiting for them to download, I mean, really, who likes to do that? <laughs> I mean, even, even if it's, you, you book a travel flight and then you have to launch a PDF to get to what you need, it's annoying. But if you have 20 of them and you're doing this all day, it's a real problem. But when you have this today, tomorrow, Alexa, tell me about EU trust and social networks. And the answer is right there. If that answer is on the screen in HTML, it's not on the screen in, as a document. It's HTML. It came from a knowledge atom, and all the atoms are exactly the same. They've been normalized, so you can easily render them as HTML because you know what to expect. So you've generated an answer. And since all of this stuff is the same, you can click on the button in any browser to say, read this to me, so the thing can read it. And eventually, this stuff will link up to the personal assistants so that you can ask more and more and more. The enabling concept here is dynamic answer composition. This is what users are looking for, answers, not documents. You could maintain a knowledge set where you're maintaining each atom individually. And I'm aware of an insurance company in the US and California that did this in a database, where every single paragraph or every single contract was individually managed in a database. And they called up and said, well, we've gotten to the point where we have 400 people working on this because it's distributed around the world. But we can't maintain it anymore because the laws are changing too quickly 
and the people can't keep the information in the database up to date anymore. So every time we try to generate a contract, it's generating all this old stuff. And we know it because we've got a big backlog. What can we do about it? The answer is you can't do much about it because all of the stuff is in a database in this tiny little format. And first they need to get it back out if they want to put it into some processable format. But getting to this, this is, this is where AI can be very, very well used to identify which atoms are relevant to the query. What are the relationships between those? How to compose better answers over time? How to look at the way users are using knowledge? If the user clicks here and opens up the topic that contained this atom, then I know that somehow this atom has information that users are more interested in. And I can use that as a learning input <clears throat> um, the AI that we see a lot today is focusing on anticipating what users want within a specific domain. So, how to bake fish. You could use IBM Watson to train the computer or train, train the software how to bake fish or how to diagnose an illness. It's a very tightly defined domain that is well known and the AI network is trained. This, however, is domain agnostic. In order to solve the problem across all companies, not every company can put in domain-specific AI training for every single business problem they have. So something has to be a little bit more flexible. I have this collection of documents. I want to turn it into atoms. I need some way to get answers out of this and accelerate my business processes without having to train it. Because if I have to train it, I'll never be able to scale this throughout the business. And scalability is the big, big thing. I want to talk a little bit about technology selection in the company. The, um, the, you, you look around here on the trade show, there are a lot of different technologies out there that you can use. Um, what's coming in the future is the, um, the dissolving of documents. For the end users, it's the knowledge that's becoming important. The, knowledge, the documents capture the knowledge, but the knowledge itself is what people will start working with because of AI. It's bringing this total transformation into the entire problem, into the entire formula. And you have to be aware of it because if you are making the wrong technology decisions in the organization now, when you have the chance to make the right ones, then in the future you may not have the ability to get into an atomic knowledge model and embrace the full power of what AI can do for you. One of them is, and this came from an earlier presentation, allow heterogeneous authoring. People in different places with different talents author in different ways, tell their story in different ways, and save their story in different places. Some people can handle saving things to a hard drive. Other people can save it to SharePoint. It can be as complicated as they can handle it, but one of the rules is don't ask people to do more than they're already capable of doing because any system that's doing that is ultimately going to fail. Keep authoring and management tools easy. Avoid systems that require expertise. So if in IT you require 20 people to maintain a me metadata or a taxonomy not model or some other technology that's wildly complicated, this is going to become unscalable. So when selecting technology, make sure you put it through a very, very tight, restrictive decision. Is this going to scale? It might sound like it's a really good idea, but is this going to scale? Often it doesn't, but there are many technologies out there that will. Ensure, also, of course, this is almost a, um, a no-brainer. Ensure tools are based on open formats, that they are automatable with APIs and web services and authoring tools should generally be widely accepted. So if somebody steps off of your authoring team, you can bring somebody else into the authoring team. Select systems that reduce internal processes, not just that make things better, but they should at the same time reduce the internal processes. That's the whole point of technology to begin with, not to just move it around. The entire digitalization phase was, let's take it away from books and let's put it into online books, but nothing changed. It made it better, but it didn't save a lot of effort. Ensure authoring processes are separated from consumer processes. This is describing a tendency of some companies to say, here is where we keep all of our knowledge. 
This leads to the problems that most people complain about. All of our knowledge is here. Now everybody needs to understand how do I get into that location to find the knowledge and access the knowledge that can often be too complicated for end users and too time consuming. By separating these things saying here is where we tell our stories around the world and here is where we access our knowledge around the world, we can take this problem away. So, I'll summarize. The number of narratives is continuously growing. The number of stories we tell. The complexity of each one of them is continuously growing. In most business, an overview is already impossible. The one company that I talked about with PDF files, getting information from their internal procedures and from Germany and from the EU and from ISO, the, this is a real thing. Information is coming from multiple sources. They have nearly one million of these PDF files and they're changing constantly. They don't have an overview. Knowledge processes that rely on human processes will fail. The, the most optimal situation is somebody tells their story and they document their story. That's enough, that's the minimum, it should end there. For an end user, they want to say, I need this knowledge so that I can do my job. That should be a minimal effort. And everything in between, the goal needs to be automate everything in between. And as soon as we start putting human processes on these middle steps, we end up with unscalabilities that go from the author to the consumer. And eventually, it will become completely unscalable and fail. We, um, we have just had a meeting with one customer that was in Germany where they have a SharePoint installation on premise that is filled with about 60,000 documents. Maybe that doesn't sound like so much. But the question was, is should they do anything with these 60,000 documents? And then it came out that nobody knew what was in those 60,000 documents and nobody was accessing, accessing them anyway and hadn't accessed them for over a year. So you wonder, what is that knowledge? Why did it fail, that knowledge? Why did it fail to be used? Usually, unscalability. Knowledge solutions must separate authoring from consuming. I said this before, a complete separation allows you to automate everything in between. By piling it all together and saying, this is a one-size-fits-all solution, I put all my stories in and that's where everybody gets all of their knowledge, then it becomes difficult to meet the requirements of authors and meet the requirements of the consumers at the same time. That can be security, that can be metadata, that can be all kinds of conflicts, that can be redundancy. You end up with a situation where you can't automate because everybody's busy using it. Of greatest importance, focusing on the quality and completeness of the stories. This is the knowledge, this is the knowledge capture. This is the, what's the most valuable to the company. There's always a way to get this out to end users. This last one refers to the picture that I had before about Siri, with Siri and Alexa and smartphones. One last thing to keep in mind is that the knowledge that your company has, it's not just enough to deliver it to users because very, very soon you will be forced to deliver it to systems. Other systems that have more and more AI in them. Other systems that need to know how to do something and the systems can't read documents. So you have to be ready for this time by selecting systems that allow the stories to be used and told to those end systems. So, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Concept, atomic knowledge. 